A very good morning and welcome to the fifth webinar by Fintech Advisory Services and the Asian Bankers Association. My name is Arpita Bedekar. I am the head of strategy and planning at Fintech. For those of you who do not know much about us, Fintech is a specialist in research, training and advisory on anti-money laundering and countering the financing of terrorism. We operate in several countries across Asia and endeavor to deliver the latest regional insights and specialized knowledge on a variety of topics around AML and CFT through research summits webinars and classroom training our webinar today is on trade based money laundering emerging risks and mitigation strategies last year on the second webinar in the fintech aba series we looked at an overview of tbml the complexities involved and trade transaction monitoring techniques A recording of that webinar is available on our website fintech.com for all those who might want to go back and refer to it. In the current webinar we take the discussion around TBML forward benefited by three different perspectives one from a global think tank one from a global technology company and the third from an experienced banker. We look more specifically at some of the prevalent as well as emerging global risks such as free trade zones illegal wildlife trade sanctions and so on and we will also ask each of these experts to tell us what banks and financial institutions can do to mitigate these risks so let me introduce the speakers for today our first speaker for today lakshmi kumar is the policy director at global financial integrity with several years of experience working on issues of financial policy securities investigation regulatory governance anti corruption and aml cft she is a lawyer and policy professional having worked with governments and regulatory agencies across south asia east africa and eurasia to investigate ml and tf risks to their financial systems our second speaker jane lee business solutions specialist at acuity has around 5 years of solution consulting experience in the kyc payments risk and compliance domain as part of the business solutions group based in singapore she is responsible for helping corporate financial institutions and non bank financial institutions across the asia pacific manage their money laundering and sanctions risks jane holds a bachelor's in science from singapore management university the third and final speaker shafat mujawar faculty member with fintech advisory services is a banker with over 25 years of experience mainly in regulatory compliance kyc aml and retail banking operations she has worked with a cooperative bank leading indian private sector banks and a foreign bank she has had experience with setting up the compliance function at indusind bank where she was actively involved with a variety of compliance aspects and in building the compliance culture through various initiatives She is a certified bank trainer from the Indian Institute of Banking and Finance besides completing CAIIB. Lakshmi, Jane and Shafat, welcome to the webinar and thanks for joining us. Now Global Financial Integrity has done some pioneering research on illegal trade flows and their damaging impact on developing economies and I'd like to request Lakshmi to begin by giving us some insights into the scale of the problem and its effect on regulation and supervision. Good afternoon. My name is Shafat. I'm the policy director at Global Financial Integrity, a Washington DC based think tank that specializes in advocacy advisory and research services related to illicit financial flows. The main thrust of our work looks at how trade can act as both an enabler and facilitator of illicit finance and what are sort of mitigating measures that can be undertaken to address this. For the purposes of this webinar I will be focusing on the issue of trade based money laundering. Now before we sink into sort of the meat of the subject I think it's important to sort of frame this discussion with some big picture numbers. Now global data on uh payments shows us that about annually 3.07 quadrillion dollars move through the financial system through payments. Now the World Trade Organization shows that 16 trillion dollars are sort of the account for trade transactions that move through the financial system now what this shows us is that 
two percent of you know total payments are represented through trade now as we break these numbers down further common wisdom through organizations such as the wolfsburg group says that 80 percent of all trade is open account trade this simply means that the trade transactions 80 percent do not depend on documents to sort of back the trade transactions which simply again means that they don't require a letter of credit or other similar documents that are given by banks or issued by banks to accompany a trade transaction. They are simply direct payments between the related entities to that transaction. Now, looking at these numbers, it simply means that 20%, which is 0.1% of the value of global payments is accounted for trade transactions. And it is only this 0.1% can banks supervise when they are trying to deal with the issue of trade-based money laundering. Now, why is this number breakdown so important? Because the number breakdown helps us understand what should be the regulatory approach at a national level, what should be the regulatory approach or sort of the monitoring and supervision approach for a financial institution. Now, if by the common wisdom, which says that 80% are all open account trades, it would mean that banks are not the best first line of defense regulators because they are unable to adequately monitor and supervise trade transactions because they simply do not have the information. Now, while this is certainly true for most Western economies, what we have found and what, you know, once you start digging into the meat of the matter, is that even in Western economies, within market segments, there are market segments that are heavily dependent on documentary trade transactions. For example, sort of the gold sector is one such example where it is very dependent on uh, documentary trade transactions. Now, when we move to emerging economies, it's a different picture. Depending on the country in question, a lot of trade is heavily backed and dependent on documentary trade transactions and not open account trade transactions. Now, in those situations, clearly the banks are the best first line defense. Therefore, any approach or any understanding of TBML, both from a national regulatory perspective, but also at an institutional level to monitor and understand risk, is important to know whether the country that is being dealt with or the country in question, its trade transactions are predominantly open account or depend on documents. And secondly, what is the practice within the market segment that is being dealt with? Do they require documents or is it predominantly open account? Now, answering those two questions helps flesh out how TBML should be regulated and how legislation in terms of reporting entities or entities that should have additional money laundering oblig AML obligations should be captured. The next question, therefore, is then what is TBML and how do we deal with it? TBML shortly is, you know, is the process of disguising the proceeds of crime. It is simply the moving the value through the use of trade transactions. And like in any money laundering scheme, its purpose is to disguise the origins and the illicit nature of the fund. Trade misinvoicing is one method of carrying out trade-based money laundering, and it's simply disguising the value, volume, origin, and type of commodity. Now, I'm going to sort of give you two quick examples for for this, one is on the value and the other is on the type of commodity. I should say at the outset that any examples that are used in this uh, webinar, the products, countries have changed in order to sort of, you know, protect the sensitivity of information. Now, in the first example, first case study, one which is in value of value, we deal with a company R based out of Bangladesh, which is, you know, a client of a certain bank and deals with it's dealing with export import business and in the trade of cattle. Now, this company is trying to import onions from India and therefore secures a letter of credit for $60,000 to import 100 metric tons. Now, the bank in question in Bangladesh issues the letter of credit. And then we find that the company that has imported the onions is now selling those onions 
for 25,000 taka per metric ton, which is what it is on the open market value. Now, however, the invoice itself that is submitted to the bank shows the value at 50,000 taka per metric ton. Now, this is especially curious because there's a huge discrepancy. Now, at this time in question, the only information that's available to the bank is sort of this knowledge of what is the open market value versus what is being described on the invoice itself because there's a letter of credit in this case. Uh, subsequent investigation showed that um, the company was also involved, the Bangladeshi company was also involved in the cattle trade and therefore was getting cattle from India into Bangladesh. Now, because of sort of the existing situation between both countries, that is illegal. And in order to compensate the Indian company for the cows that were being sent, the invoice value was manipulated so that the onions were over invoiced to account for actually the trade in cattle, which they could not legitimately declare. Now, as from the financial institution's perspective, all this required was to have seen what is the invoice value? What is the open market trade? And sort of that's an obviously an obvious red flag. Now, the illegal border crossing, you know, that's something that doesn't fall within the purview of the bank. But that was the, you know, the first red flag. Now, with the case of commodities in the developing world and in the emerging markets in general, there has been a huge push now to protect local textile textile industries because the, the because of the dumping of used clothes in those countries. Now, a lot of countries, especially on the African continent and in certain other parts, impose very high import rates on used clothing. Now, in order to avoid these high taxes, what, what sometimes an importer will do is to simply declare the item as widgets or something else, which is treated with lower tariff rates. Now, what this does is, you know, it reduces revenues to the customs department, but also more problematically, it floods the market with cheap clothes. And then in the long term, you know, further handicaps and cripples um, the clothing industry. Now, these are sort of two examples, you know, we could talk further more. But in a sense, this sort of sets up how trade misinvoicing can be used as a trade based money laundering vehicle. Thanks, Lakshmi. I think the use of those two examples throws some light on the complexities involved and really how easy it is for criminals to manipulate the system. Can you also give us a sense of the need for greater transparency in knowing the ben beneficial owners of companies that are involved in the trade and the impact that it would have on illicit financial flows? Now, a big chunk of what is the bedrock of money laundering in general is the issue of beneficial ownership. Beneficial ownership, simply put, is understanding who is the real person that is controlling a legal entity. And, you know, like, like in any other financial or trade transaction, understanding who controls the business that is responsible for trading gives, gives both the bank and any other regulator involved a clearer sense of who to hold accountable, who to file a case against. Now, this is important in case, especially if a bank or a financial institution is worried about onboarding or facilitating payments of, let's say, a sanctioned individual, um, a high-risk customer, a high-risk jurisdiction, <clears throat> and any anyone else with sort of a criminal record. One of the huge gaps we see in beneficial ownership information is the lack of access between different parts of the government and between financial institutions and their relationship to the government. Now, it's called, at this point in time, you know, FIUs, the body that is responsible for registering uh, legal entities, usually it will have beneficial ownership information. But customs departments don't always have beneficial ownership information. And therefore, unless customs departments and financial institutions are adequately synced up, it is very hard to sort of identify and investigate cases of trade-based money laundering as and when it happens. Now, sort of to give an example, we're looking at a case where even a financial institution and the customs department separately would not be, have been able to identify a case of trade-based money laundering. This is one of sort of, you know, coffee exports in Colombia. Now, if you look at this slide, you can see that uh, between 2009 and 2018, global coffee export values averaged 3.39 USD uh, per kilo, and in Colombia it was 3.89.
Now, the two companies that we are dealing with with the, with the subject of the investigation also were trading at 3.31 and 3.33. They're highlighted in red, company A1, company A2. But when we started breaking down their transactions further over the 10-year period, and what you have here is a sample from 2016, what was tremendously interesting is that the value of the goods they were exporting down to the cents was an exact match for each other. And that is incredibly hard to do. You don't come across that. How would two companies, every transaction that they're doing matches down to the sense? You know, that's a virtual impossibility. And so, you know, exploring and digging further, we found out that both the companies in question are held by the same parent company, which means that the beneficial owner for both the companies are same. So on paper, they are reporting themselves to the customs department on the, and to the banks in questions as unrelated entities. But in reality, they are very much related. In fact, they're owned by the same parent company. And, you know, the other second puzzling thing about this slide is, is you look at the different exploration, export declaration dates. And you see that it doesn't make sense to ship identical values in two separate shipments because that adds to your shipping costs. So that leads to the question, is this one of this, is there, is there fake invoicing? Is there phantom shipping going on? And that's another red flag about this transaction. Now, as I said earlier, on its own, neither a financial institution or a customs department just wouldn't have had enough information to judiciously understand that this was TBML. And for sort of successful investigation, what is you need is a complete, clear-eyed picture of what the transaction looked like along with the values, along with beneficial ownership, to understand why this was problematic. Wow, that's alarming and clearly calls out for greater collaboration amongst agencies to deal with this problem at a unified level. Now, another area of risk for TBML that GFI has pointed out is free trade zones. In what ways are free trade zones contributing to the problem? And what can financial institutions watch out for when conducting due diligence on trade transactions involving FTZs. So the last and final part of this webinar is to deal with free trade zones and trade-based money laundering. You know, free trade zones are sort of growing year on year. They are considered as, you know, hubs for trade facilitation, especially in economically depressed places. And they've considered huge economic incentives for emerging markets. Now, the reasons why free trade zones are sort of high risk is because Free trade zones don't often have customs departments actually exercise any jurisdiction. Also, trade transactions that are carried out through FTs that don't often report suspicious transaction reports or CTRs to FIUs. The other thing that it's you know commonly noticed is these tend to be very cash intensive businesses for whatever reason, and therefore you know it's an automatic automatic high risk. You know, some of the other sort of concerns with FTZs are sort of just in general the lack of oversight and monitoring. And so one of the common examples we see in terms of case studies is because FTZs usually have huge tax incentives, so there's no import or export duties that are often paid. You will often see goods that come in into sort of a special economic zone or an FTZ, and let's say it's it's gold that's valued at 500 kilos that's coming from Africa and, you know, it may be coming through sort of, you know, problems that are ongoing within the DRC or other parts that are, you have transnational criminal groups that are exporting this gold. Once it gets to sort of Dubai, the certificate of origin will change. It will now be labeled as gold coming from the UAE. So gold coming from the UAE will not be treated by Switzerland or India or any other place as high risk gold because there's nothing to show that is related to sort of groups that may be goal that is perhaps funding sort of terrorists or other transnational criminal elements. The other thing is that because there is no taxes within these free trade zones, it is very easy to sort of manipulate, as I said, the volume, value, the origin and the type of commodity because there is no one doing any vetting. Now, with all of this in mind, the question is then what can be really done. And some of the suggested recommendations, these by no means are a laundry list, they're just a very small subset of what can be done. Don't apply just to free trade zones, apply to TBML in general, but are perhaps sort of higher risk. 
Now, for starters, I think there has to be sort of better education on trade finance and how TBML differs from ABL, uh, AML, because they are truly distinct forms of money laundering, require different skill sets and different approaches. The other thing is that customers that are based out of free trade zones should automatically be considered higher risk. Financial institutions should have a ready and available list of what free trade zones are. Because as matters stand right now, there is no global uniform list of the number of free trade zones available. No one really knows how many there are. So that would be of a tremendous help. Second, I think in general, and this is sort of a general uh, approach, is to understand whether the transactions actually really make sense. So if you see pork going to a free trade zone in the UAE or Saudi Arabia, that should raise a red flag. Or any pork going anywhere to Dubai or Saudi Arabia should raise a red flag because those are not big pork consumption markets. So another example would be you know, if there are speedboats being sent to Mongolia. Mongolia is a landlocked country. There are no reason that large quantities of speedboats should be going there. Uh, the other thing to sort of you know better understand is what is the good that's being transacted in? How does it affect its risk profile? You know, dual use goods automatically it's high risk because of national security reasons. Cigarettes are known for sort of being counterfeited. That's an automatic high risk uh, 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 product. Similarly with the case with gold, you know, markets like India and China are big consumers of gold and there's a there are huge questions surrounding whether these whether gold is being used to funnel conflict all over the world and it's an often a preferred method for financing for groups involved in sort of transnational criminal activity because there is less let's say supervision over other types of criminal activity now then the other issue is that you know is the is the transaction being routed through multiple uh, locations to obfuscate What's going on? And this is especially high risk for free trade zones because free trade zones are black holes of information. So if it's going through multiple free trade zones, that is in itself a risk. And, you know, sort of another sort of another issue is, is there an inherent risk of doing business with this particular jurisdiction? Some jurisdictions are more high risk than others. And the, I think the, it is to sort of understand whether the banking risk differs from the trade risk. And so what that means, you know, these by no means are sort of a laundry list. A lot of this overlaps with what is going on in terms of sort of general TBML regulation for fi uh, financial institutions. But hopefully this sets the conversation up for sort of requesting governments to provide financial institutions with an understanding of how many free trade zones are located in the countries that they are based in, how many free trade zones are located in the countries that they interact with. Um, I look forward to any questions, comments, and I'm always available. Please feel free to reach out to me with any concerns or questions, and I'm always happy to answer them. Thank you. Well, thanks very much, Lakshmi, and we will, of course, come back to you during the question-answer session. Let's now bring in Jane Lee into this conversation. Jane, Equity works with banks and financial institutions from all over the world. In your experience, how can institutions in Asia better inculcate the global best practices and the culture of trade compliance. To start off, let us look at the AML regulations as a whole. There are many AML regulations around the world, but how do you ensure that you are compliant enough? Do you look at the global regulations, the domestic regulations or both? In an organization, there should be an enterprise-wide approach for compliance. This will allow the organization to manage AML risk in a consistent manner. At an enterprise level, there should be a global standard that each of the branches or officers should follow. And then, at the branch level, the local regulatory requirements should supplement the enterprise-wide policy. Going back to the basics, organizations have to understand their customer type, the geographical locations where they deal in, and the products and services offered. With this, an effective risk-based approach and framework can be developed. As we all know that trade finance are used by companies to facilitate international trades, which involve different parties from different jurisdictions. I would say, trade finance is a globally identified as a high-risk product which is often used by criminal organizations to launder funds or conduct terrorist financing. 
In my opinion, in order to ensure that the end-to-end -end process of the trade does not violate any regulations, parties involved have to work together to conduct their due diligence. If one party finds out the other did not conduct their due diligence, their reputations will be at stake. Moving on to the regulations, a domino effect had been observed whereby a change in the widely followed regulations such as OFAC and UN, it will trigger the domestic regulations to follow as well. Therefore, no matter the global regulations or the domestic regulations, organisations will be affected by the growing need for regulatory compliance. Throughout the years, we can see that different AML regulations and guidelines with greater focus on TPML have been established. From mid-2018 till date, OFAC had issued a couple of advisories in relation to North Korea and Iran trades. One of the key drivers to keep up and comply with the regulations is the cost of non-compliance. In 2019, there were 58 AML penalties amounting to 8.14 billion, which is double the amount of penalties handed out in 2018. With the US OFAC being the most active regulator, some of the major fines imposed by OFAC in 2019 includes Standard Chartered Bank, Unicredit Group Bank, and British Arab Commercial Bank. These banks were fined due to the processing of transactions which violate certain US sanction programs. Bringing the focus to unique credit, one of the main issues pointed out by OFAC is that they failed to identify the sanctioned parties within the trade finance documents. Hence, ensuring that all trade finance documents going through the proper due diligence process is very important. Since US dollar is the most powerful currency in the world and is widely used for trading due to its high liquidity nature, let us put our focus on the OFAC regulations. So, who has to comply with the OFAC regulation? It is clear that anyone or anything under the US umbrella have to comply with the regulations. These include any US person or any transactions involving US currency or goods or any US incorporated entities and their foreign branches. However, US can impose secondary sanctions to further pressurize countries like North Korea, Iran and Russia. When we talk about secondary sanctions, it means that US can impose penalties on any non-US related person, any transaction involving non-US currency or goods. In the OFAC SDN list, you will notice that for certain entities, there are additional information which states subject to secondary sanctions. This means that if a non-US related transaction deals with those SDN, the involved parties in the transaction can potentially be penalised by OFAC. Just recently, secondary sanctions were imposed by OFAC on six companies based in Hong Kong, China and Dubai for engaging in significant transactions involving Iranian petroleum. With the growing secondary sanctions entities, FIs have to be very careful in order to remain accessible to the US market. In order to achieve effective compliance measures, FIs have to keep people, process and technology in mind. These are the three pillars that will create a good synergy between each other. An independent compliance department has to clearly define the compliance vision for the FI and manage the compliance program within the organization. There has to be an effective AML policies in place, including the standard procedure that one must take. With today's modern technology world, FIs should use technology to help achieve a cost-effective process. The compliance team has to know the regulations and guidelines to follow from the global regulations and guidelines to the domestic regulations. With that, a proper enterprise-wide policies can be established within the organization. Across the different regulations and guidelines, you can see some common buzzwords like due diligence, policies and processes, trainings, know your customers, and sanction screening. Basically, FIs have to have proper procedures in place to know your customer and transactions. 
Since these procedures have to be executed by employees, proper compliance training within the organizations are important. Everyone in the organization has to work together to ensure all due diligence are carried out and abnormal activities are being identified promptly. Knowing your customer and transaction is a big part of trade finance. FIs have to have proper processes to conduct proper due diligence on each party's goods, vessels that are involved in the trade finance transactions. It is important to know your customer, know their source of funds and know their purpose of the transactions. In order to meet the regulatory expectations, all parties involved in the trade must be well equipped to screen for sanctioned entities throughout the life cycle of the trade. Thanks, Jane. Typically, a trade can last for a few months, if not years. And given the dynamic complex regime, I'm sure it's not easy for financial institutions to keep track of changes. How can financial institutions go about tackling this challenge? Indeed, trade finance has a life cycle of a few months or more. In the life cycle, it will typically involve onboarding, initiation of trade, shipping documents checked, remittance and shipment of goods. Throughout these activities, watch lists may be updated at different points of time. Hence, screening only during the time of onboarding or when information is received are not sufficient. With the dynamic watch list, continuous delta screening is required in order to know any involvement of sanctioned entities promptly. When we talk about dynamic compliance regime, I would say that the ever-changing global watch list is something crucial for each organization. From this chart, you can see how the OFAC, UN, EU and HM Treasury list changed throughout the last five years. OFAC having more than four times more entities as compared to the rest has an increment of 37% from 2014 to 2019. The changes in the OFAC watch list are triggered by events such as the lift of Iran sanctions in 2016 and the reimposed of Iran sanctions in 2018. Going into 2020, this list will continue to change given that in January, there were already new designations added by OFAC. Vessels play a major part in facilitating international trades. From 2018 to 2019, it was seen to have 164% increase in vessels sanctioned by OFAC. Vessel movements can be dynamic as well. When vessels are at sea, they can travel to any part of the world. In order to reduce risk of non-compliant, you should be wondering where did the vessel stop by in the last, let's say, 90 days. Did the vessel stop at the initial plan ports during the transaction? And you should also be interested in if the vessel stopped near or in any sanctioned countries. These are crucial information that flag out any potential misconduct by the parties involved in the transaction. Now, I would like to highlight the importance of quality data. The accessibility to updated and enhanced watch list is important for name screening. Regulatory agencies like OFAC may not provide critical vessel data such as beneficial owners, IMO numbers, former vessel's name, and all vessel names belonging to a sanctioned country. As for location, it may not state all cities and seaports of the sanctioned country. Hence, if a FI do not want to do anything related to the sanctioned countries, with the OFAC published list, it is not sufficient. Looking at OFAC's 50% rules, it states that entities directly or indirectly own 50% or more by a sanctioned entity is also sanctioned. However, OFAC did not provide all the names of the entities owned by the sanctioned entities. Hence, looking beyond the standard published watch list is definitely necessary to attain these additional entity names. Trade finance involves goods which can be dual-use goods. Dual use goods involved can be a sign of misconduct by the parties involved. Hence, EU has published a dual use goods list and US has also published a list of goods which requires the necessary license. The published list may only include standard good names but not the synonyms, chemical names and harmonized codes of the goods. 
parties may try to be sneaky by using names or codes other than the names listed by the regulatory agencies. Since bankers are not chemists, having access to a screening solution with enhanced goods list is effective in flagging out suspicious transactions. In essence, the full trade life cycles have to be screened continuously against the updated watch list. Keeping a lookout of vessel history and vessel routes are also important in case of travelling to any sanctioned countries. A typical process will be to screen all involved parties of a trade, review the screening results and ensure that proper audit trail is in place. Once the entire trade transaction information is within the platform, which can provide alerts on any involvement of sanctioned entities, dual use goods or vessels travelling to sanctioned countries, the FI then can promptly react to the situation or raise any suspicious transaction report. Thanks a lot, Jane. My next question to you is, what is the role that technology companies are playing to further safeguard financial institutions from trade-based money laundering? Let's look at some deceptive shipping practices as these are typically where FIs needed help from technology companies. Ship-to-ship -ship transfers are commonly used to facilitate shipping to sanctioned countries. In 2017, B-Whale Corporate was identified by OFAC that it processed a shipment that involved Iranian vessels on the STN list. Its shipment conducted a ship-to-ship -ship transfer of Iranian oil and during this transfer, the vessel's automatic identification system was switched off. The number of ship-to-ship -ship transfer co continues to grow. From 2018 to 2019, we can see that the North Korean ship-to-ship -ship transfer area has been expanded. And it was identified that before and after the ship-to-ship -ship transfer, the vessels tend to visit ports in China, Taiwan and South Korea. Therefore, ship-to-ship -ship transfer can potentially conceal the origin and destination of the cargoes. Vessels potentially can go dark when committing a violation. In 2019, US seized a North Korean cargo ship for the first time. It was carrying 3 million shipments of coal in Indonesian waters in 2018. This ship involves in shipping coal from North Korea to countries like China to fund the country's nuclear weapons. The vessel has not been broadcasting an automatic identification system signal since August 2017. Vessel name change are also common in attempt to hide the previous illegal activities. For example, in the old fact list, the sanctioned vessel is called Saman 2. However, based on the vessel history, the name of the vessel has been changed six times. In order to hide the vessel's identity, parties may use formal vessel name in the trade or at times, if your watch list is not updated with the latest vessel name, then you will not be able to identify the sanctioned vessel. In TBML, there are a number of complexities to consider such as the large number of KYC checks, numerous international reference lists to screen, and updates on vessel movements. Technology companies like Equity are investing heavily on innovative ways to solve challenges like identification of ship-to-ship -ship transfers, manipulations of automatic identification system, and suspicious vessel movement. The synergy of the three pillars, people, process, and technology, are important for execution. Therefore, with a partner relationship, both FIs and technology companies can work together to minimize the risk of non-compliance in the most cost-effective way. Thanks a lot, Jane. Thanks very much for that practical advice that banks can implement. I think it's a good place to hear from our third speaker, Shafat Mujawar. Shafat, as Lakshmi said earlier, banks are the first line of defense when it comes to detecting and reporting illegal money flows through trade. May I request you to reiterate some of the widely used trends or typologies within TBML that criminals are using to move funds? Also, have you observed any newer areas of risk within TBML? Good morning and good afternoon to all. Thanks, Arpita, and I will cover the newer trends within TBML. 
But before we jump into the typologies, we'd like to invite attention to the FATF definition of DBML, which states that it is the process of disguising the proceeds of crime and moving value through the use of trade transactions in an attempt to legitimize their illicit origins. Hence, in TBML, the movement of value is of utmost importance. Coming to the TBML typologies, some of the traditional typologies are under invoicing of goods. Here, the invoice is raised for a lower value of the goods than the actual worth of the goods. For example, if an exporter A in India exports 1000 wallets to an importer B in Sri Lanka and raises an invoice for $1 each, while this wallet is worth $2. Since the invoice has been raised only for $1000, the importer B remits only $1,000 to A while the consignment was worth $2,000. So B has several options now. B can either sell these in the markets in Sri Lanka for $2 and then remit the balance $1,000 as cash to the exporter A or pay cash to the associate of the exporter in Sri Lanka or probably deposit this cash in his own bank account or maybe even transfer these funds to a criminal organization that could be probably controlling these business transactions. Exactly opposite of this is over invoicing of goods where the invoice is raised for a higher value of the goods than the actual worth of the goods and in the above given example the exporter would then send cash to the importer in case the goods were exported at $3 each. Another typology is the multiple invoicing of goods which is nothing but duplicate multiple invoices are raised for the same transaction thereby leading to multiple remittances. Forged or duplicate documents this is a big challenge that most of the banks face. The documents like the bill of entry evidencing the actual entry of the goods into the country or the bill of lading which shows that indeed the goods have left the shores of the country are either forged or duplicate once are submitted. That's why it becomes essential that the scrutiny of documents is done diligently. Short shipping of goods, here the exporter ships fewer goods than the invoiced quantity of goods and thereby he misrepresents the true value of the goods in the documents. Opposite of this, overshipping, the exporter ships more goods than the invoiced quantity of goods. Phantom shipping, here no goods are actually shipped but only the invoices are raised. The fraudulent documentation generated is used to justify the payments that are sent abroad. Dual use goods. DUG as it is commonly known as. This is one of the recent trends that we have seen. While it has been in existence, but yes, definitely it is catching up. This can be used for both civilian and commercial purposes as well as military or nuclear or weapons of mass destruction. Some of the examples of dual use goods are radio navigation systems like GPS or chemicals like chlorine or hexamine. Bankers are not chemists or engineers or nuclear scientists, neither do we have PhDs to understand which goods can be used for dual purposes, right? Hence, it becomes essential that we look up for information that is helpful in identifying such dual-use goods. UK's FCA has released one such list of dual-use goods which can be helpful in identifying this category of goods. The use of professionals like accountants, consultants, lawyers, etc. that are rendered to, the, rendered to the clients is another channel for TBML that we have recently seen. The modalities here could be similar like under invoicing or over invoicing, raising multiple invoices for the same services rendered. Now all this could be possible only with collusion between the service providers and the clients. For example, an outer remittance is done towards payment of consultancy services to a consultant for USD $50,000 by a trading firm who has declared its annual turnover of $150,000. Here it's likely that probably this could be a fake invoice and probably the consultant may not even exist given the profile of this client. Another recent trend in TBML what we have seen is illegal wildlife trade. Now, this continues to be viewed as being outside mainstream crime. Illegal wildlife trade generates an estimated 20 billion US dollars annually and is the fourth most profitable criminal trafficking enterprise behind drugs, arms and human trafficking, according to the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime. Its demand as a source of alternative medicine or a status symbol for art, decor, furniture, jewelry, cosmetics, perfumes, pets, etc. makes it more vulnerable. 
the people involved in illegal wildlife trade and laundering generally are the owners or employees of legitimate companies such as animal traders wildlife park owners wildlife breeders antique dealers or fashion trading companies or traditional medicine suppliers who carry out such illegal trades along with their legal trades zoos for example can rightfully import wildlife for conservation purposes however the same zoo can also allow criminals to do wildlife trafficking and use breeding programs and get new animals into the zoo last but not the least is the illegal trading of arts and antiquities this is the latest trend across the globe as dealings in art are not highly regulated and even cash transactions in these dealings are not required to be reported in most of the countries while eu's fifth aml directives to be implemented by its member states effective jan 2020 have brought persons dealing in uh, dealing in art under its ambit and made it mandatory to report transactions either single or linked transactions equal to or about 10000 euros most of the other jurisdictions are yet to take such drastic statutory steps It is the subject of value of art that makes this typology more challenging for bankers and government authorities like customs. For example, a German-based art dealer could sell a painting worth fifty worth fifty thousand euros to a Hong Kong buyer by invoicing for hundred thousand dollars, sorry, hundred thousand euros, where the Hong Kong buyer is able to transfer fifty thousand euros out of Hong Kong. Another case. a uh, jean michel basquiat's 1981 painting hannibal had been smuggled into us by a former brazilian banker who was convicted of money laundering and other offenses and had allegedly converted some of his laundered proceeds into an art collection although this painting was appraised at a value of 8 million dollars it had been smuggled by ferreira into the us from brazil why the netherlands with false shipping invoices stating that the contents of the shipping were worth 100 dollars only so as we can see that the criminals are now finding innovative ways to do trade based money laundering like the illegal wildlife trade and the illegal trading of art thank you thanks a lot shafat given this vast array of risks how can banks structure their tbml programs such that they can mitigate some of these risks and remain up to speed with new developments and new regulations in the area of tbml arpita as you rightly said banks have to maintain speed with the innovative ways of criminals like illegal wildlife trade etc that have emerged in the recent past few years while banks are taking measures to mitigate these risks I would say putting in place a comprehensive TPML program having these eight elements would further help. The first element being governance and oversight. It should be ensured that the standards and processes and controls are clearly defined as the policies and standardized operating procedures or the SOPs as we call them. The RFIs for TPML should definitely be incorporated in the SOPs. the handling of exceptions including those based on past experiences as well as an escalation matrix for handling such exceptions should be included the process for escalation of suspicious transactions should also be clearly laid out it is very important to review and update these policies and sops as well whenever there are changes in the regulatory guidelines or any other domestic or international guidelines pertaining to goods sanctions vessels etc The policies and SOPs should be reviewed at least annually. The next element is the trade customers due diligence and KYC. At the time of onboarding the trade customers, it is of utmost importance to understand the customer's profile, including the source of funds, the nature of business, the account of parties and the jurisdictions in which they operate or facilitate the transactions, as also the customer's expected transaction activity in the account. Trade and tax havens make a dangerous combination. That's why at the time of onboarding, it is not only essential to identify customers that are domiciled in tax havens, but also to identify their subsidiaries in tax havens. For example, Leaf Corporation in New Zealand will purchase goods from a subsidiary Seed Limited in Mauritius. Now here Leaf Corporation will overpay for goods that it buys from its subsidiary. 
and in doing so, it will move funds to Mauritius, which is a tax heaven. Enhanced due diligence should also be done for high-risk clients, especially those having beneficial owners as PEPs or politically exposed persons, or those clients having negative news pertaining to financial crimes or having dealings in high-risk goods like precious stones and jewelry, or whether they deal in art and antiques, etc. Periodic review of the client's KYC or KYC renewal is another very important element of ongoing due diligence of the trade clients. Whether the client's business has diversified, whether it now deals in different goods, whether there are new counterparties or it has entered new jurisdictions. The next important element is the handling of trade transactions. One of the key elements to any trade transaction is the documents. The documents should be scrutinized diligently and we should look for any signs of forgery or duplication. Look for the authenticity authenticity of the document like the hologram or the stamp of the customs authorities, whether the goods mentioned or the documents match with what was mentioned at the time of transaction, etc. Also try to ascertain whether the rationale for the trade transaction and the relationship between the counterparties and the goods involved is satisfactory. Whether the buyer and the seller are in the same line of business, whether the trade makes any economic rationale. Understand the counterparties. For example, if an exporter exporting cotton to a counterparty dealing in textiles is understood, but if the counterparty is dealing in furniture, this is something unusual. Also, name screening of all the counterparties, including the vessels and the goods, should also be done against the bank's negative lists. The next element helps us in identifying suspicious transactions which is the monitoring of trade transactions. The RFIs for TBML should be implemented and at times practically it is not possible to ingest all these RFIs into the ML monitoring system. Hence, some of the red flags for TBML like forged or dupl duplicate documents will need to be monitored by the trade operations team who handle these transactions. While the ML teams will implement the RFIs for TBML, these RFIs should also be reviewed periodically and any new RFIs or modifications in the thresholds or new risk identified should be calibrated into the ML system. Also, as part of the KYC refresh or the periodic review, the expected activity in the account should also be obtained from the client apart from the other profile details. In case there is a glaring difference from what was declared at the time of onboarding, then enhanced due diligence should be performed as there could be changes in the nature of business, thereby in the nature of goods or even the counterparties. Timely filing of STRs or SARs will also help the law enforcement authorities to take appropriate action and also to alert other banks. Training of employees handling trade transactions is another key element of the TPML program and training should be imparted to new joinees of trade functions like those working in sales, operations, compliance or email sales. Further refresher training should also be imparted to these staff. Training should focus on the policies, SOPs, best practices, TPML typologies, what, for look, what to look for and what to do in case they find anything suspicious and also what is the escalation procedure to be followed. Use of technology, whether it is in the form of applications being used in the trade operations or the transaction monitoring system, all these should be reviewed and tuned to identify any new emerging risk and the changes should be brought about in these applications accordingly. Nanen, the quality assurance programs should also be put in place to check whether the processing controls are working properly and this could be done through independent testing of the TBML program. These can be carried out by the control functions like the operations or compliance. Last but not the least, the third line of defense, the internal audit. As part of their role and as part of regular audits, they should also cover TBML and check whether the policies and procedures are updated, whether the laid down processes are being followed in handling of the transactions and whether the RFIs have been implemented. So just to sum up, I would see a TBML program having elements of governance and oversight whereby the policies and SOPs are put in place and updated, the trade customers due diligence and updated, 
the trade customers due diligence and KYC including the renewal of KYC, the handling of trade transactions diligently, the timely monitoring of trade transactions including timely filing of STRs or SARs, training of employees handling trade transactions, the use of technology, having a quality assurance program and the internal audit performing the role of and also checking on the TBML program would go a long way in mitigating TBML risk. Thank you. Thanks very much, Shafat. I think that was a great wrap up of all the different elements involved in creating a robust TBML program for a financial institution. I'd like to now invite questions from our listeners. And while you are typing out your questions in the chat box on your screens, let me display this list of upcoming FinTech training programs that may be of value to your banks. The first is a FinTech ABA short term visiting program on making AML CFT the priority at banks that's coming up end of this month. This is a two day program that will be held in Mumbai and is meant for senior compliance professionals from banks across Asia. The next is our two day face to face training and certification program on trade based money laundering which will take place in Kathmandu, Nepal on March 3rd and 4th. We have the next batch of the Fintelect Certified AML CFT Professional Training, which is our four-day face-to-face training program and certification for AML practitioners across Asia to stay updated with latest tools, techniques and developments in the area of AML CFT. This will take place on March 16th to 19th in Goa, India. And before that, on March 11th to 13th, will be our three-day face-to-face FCAP batch exclusively for the insurance sector, which will be held in Pune, India. To sign up for any of these programs or for more information, please visit our website or write in to us.